Welcome back. And if you are just joining us, you have joined us for the right time at the right time because we are wine tasting. I am now going to get to do it in the most sophisticated of ways, I'm sure. Heather Downey, are there ways to open a wine bottle and oh, the ways you, things you shouldn't do? Absolutely. Um, so I've here, I actually am a sucker for a old fashioned waiter corkscrew. I believe that's the absolute best way to open a wine. An old fashioned yeah. corkscrew. So this is like the age old corkscrew. Once upon a time, they just looked like this. Mm -hmm. And it just is effortless. And if you're used to it, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and it isn't the bows and whistles of having oxygen or anything else, but I think it just is romantic and a great way to open a bottle of wine. Now, for the poor people who've had the cork split, mm -hmm. What is that all about? Why would a cork split? Well, first of all, a cork is a natural, permeable, um, natural product. So it can dry out. It is more rare nowadays. Once upon a time, it did happen quite a bit, but they have really, really great ways of um, clarifying the cork so that doesn't happen. But it also happens if, if you have a wine that is um, upright, mm -hmm. because it's a natural product, that cork will dry out. And as it dries out, oxygen will get in your wine, ruin your wine, and soften your cork. And that's usually why your cork will break. So the wines, my one or two bottles, <laughs> my wines are stored that way. Beautiful. Totally sideways. Is that enough of a slant on those or what's um, It probably could be a little bit more of a slant. What you want to make sure is that the cork stays wet. But this is only a situation if you're aging a bottle of wine. So 95% of the wines that are on the market and, and produced in the market are intended to consume within the first three years of life. Mm -hmm. so, so we don't worry You don't much. worry about it. If you're keeping the big boys, the Burgundies, the Barolos, mm -hmm. the Brunellos, the Bordeaux, all those beautiful wines, you're going to want to make sure they're stored with a wet okay. cork. Mm -hmm. now, now, my other uncorking thing is the champagnes. When yeah. you could literally, I feel like you could blind somebody. Yeah. What do you do when you're doing the champagnes? So you you have that that protective net, that, that mm -hmm. steel net that goes over um, when you take that off from the moment you take that that off you should mm -hmm. make sure that you're covering that cork with your hand when you open a bottle of champagne what most people do or Prosecco or any sparkling mm -hmm. wine what most people do um, is they twist the cork really what you should do is hold the cork and slowly twist the bottle that actually makes a big difference because you actually should never I mean, unless you're winning a Stanley Cup or a NASCAR race, you should never have this giant pop yeah. and this... Who wants to waste their champagne and let it exactly. spill out? Exactly. So you tw carefully twist Isn't the bottle. Isn't that interesting? Softly. Twist You the should bottle. only have a... If you properly open it. I get so nervous, I always want my husband to, you know, yeah. point it the other direction. Yes. Now, Heather, you opened that so easily. But I wasn't watching you pour. Is oh, I thought sorry. there was a trick. Is there a trick to pouring? Um, a good trick to pour. I usually pour from a higher, like a higher mm -hmm. and, and robust pour. I call it because mm -hmm. in doing that, I'm aerating the wine. Ah. So that's doing the same thing as if you buy one of those aerators or what have you, or even doing the same thing as if you decant a wine a little bit. Because what you're doing if you give it a robust pour is you're oxygenating it on the way into the glass. Oh. And the only trick that I think is a thing is when you pour, if you turn your bottle just at a little bit of an angle, it stops the drip. All right. So that's, so that's why people pour, do it you in don't, the fancy. Yeah. You don't just pour and lift. You pour, and twist, twist, and lift. And from a high level. Yeah. So when I'm training servers, I always say... Do a little 25% turn. Now, I don't have wine glasses that are shaped exactly like this. So why this wine glass? What's the shape of this that is perfect? Good question. So companies make wine glasses. There is a very, very scientific and, and, and artistry in, in doing that. The wine glass is intended to best serve the wine. So the shape of the wine glass will give you a better representation of what's in it if you t dare or care to have all those wine glasses. And what happens is it will hit your tongue in a different place oh. and also your olfactory glands, which is 
everything from your nose because all those flavors are from your nose. So you're going to get a very different taste from different wine glasses. When I teach my course, one of the, the homework assignments oh. is go home with your partner, open a glass of wine, pour it into a beer stein, a martini glass, a, a champagne flute, a white wine glass, a red wine glass, a coffee cup, whatever, and see how it tastes different. Surprisingly, it will taste really? very different. Yep. And, and, you know, I'm glad to know that the, the nose is so much part of it. And one of the things that you were kind of apologizing for before we went on the air is that you have a bit of a cold. Mm -hmm. How, what kind of difference would that make when you are judging wines worldwide and you have a cold? Giant, giant. Because, um, like I said, really one of the most important factors is the smell. Because the smell happens both when you smell it as well as when you taste it. Because okay. when we talk about things like you hear sommeliers say, oh yes, I, I get blackberry and cherry and blackcurrant and cinnamon and nutmeg and whatever. They don't actually taste that. They're smelling that. Uh. Even if it happens while you're drinking it, what happens in your mouth is something different. Those, these are sour, acid, tannin, okay. umami, different things like that that uh. happens on your taste buds. So that explains a little bit to me, you know, and, and I've seen this and probably you have too, where people do this mm -hmm. before they drink something. Yeah. Like, why are they doing, are they, are they doing that just to show that they know something or is it really important to do that? Well, similar to what I said about the pouring, um, in our house, before we drink a wine, you'll often see us doing a swirl. I'll tell people that are not comfortable to put it right on the table and swirl like this, and again, not only is it oxygenating the wine, but it's releasing the aroma compounds. Oh. So it, another thing that I, that I do often in my tastings is I'll pour it and I'll have it sitting in the glass and I'll tell them, smell it, mm -hmm. and they'll smell it. And then I'll say, put it back down, give it a swirl, do it again. And it's unbelievable the difference because it really opens up those aroma compounds. It's very scientific actually, as romantic as it seems. Um, well, I'm thinking all the more reason not to drink wine from a bottle, right? <laughs> so this glass that we're drinking, it's a little more difficult than most glasses to do that swirl. So this glass is intended for this type of varietal. This is a Nebbiolo, which is one of my favorite grapes. And this glass is for Nebbiolos, which is sometimes known the um, co most common way to, that people know it is a Barolo um, and or a Pinot Noir. Well, so. I am getting ready for my first taste. I have done the swirling. I have done the sniffing. Don't go away. We'll be right back and you'll see me take my first taste. Mm -hmm. 